Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our points distribution webinar. Uh, our today's speaker is Johan Brauchert from Graz University of Technology. And the title of his talk is Weighted Returnomes of Wigan Bauer Polynomials and more. And also, don't forget that after this talk, we have some virtual coffee break or some time to socialize so that which is other. Uh, please, please, Johan. Okay, thank you for the nice introduction. Welcome to uh, my talk. I'm going to talk about this uh, paper we recently posted on archive uh, where we consider this weighted uh, two norms of uh, game bar polynomials. Uh, the and more just refers to one slide in my talk at the very end. So it's uh, only a little bit an outlook what uh, needs to be done uh, after that, perhaps. So, uh, as I said, uh, this is the paper. It's jointly with uh, Peter Grabner, also from. Um, by, here from Theo Graz, uh, he says, sorry, he couldn't attend the talk. So <laughs> he just uh, came into my room shortly before uh, I walked into here. So uh, what's the outline of my talk? First, I want to give at least some pointers at motivation, but not very much. Uh, my main results, uh, which can be used then uh, by other people, the proof ideas, which are about the asymptotic part mostly. So how we got that, and that might be of independent interest so that you can uh, apply those methods for yourself in different contexts as well. And uh, the last one is simply a little outlook what uh, can be done more yeah, if we haven't done together. yet. So uh, let me come to the origin of this problem. We look at, uh, we have a a sequence of orthogonal polynomials, P1, P0, uh, P2, etc. We look at this integral with respect to the interval where these polynomials would be, say, uh, orthogonal with respect to the given weight function W. So, but that's an easy problem. So, uh, therefore, the classic polynomials, we already know what this quantity is. More, much more interesting is what happens if the W is not the right, fun, the, the right weight. So if you have a different weight, and usually you get that in applications. So that's the uh, origin of the problem. And uh, well, uh, I just mentioned here, that's the closest I come to point distribution, I guess. Uh, so the, the paper by Carlos and uh, Damir, uh, they looked at uh, that uniform distribution on SO3, and they, they looked at such integrals and actually this paper inspired uh, Damia to actually uh, compute exact expressions for, for which uh, the only were uh, estimates in the, in the paper by Carlos and Damia. And uh, the paper of, of Damia then kicked off uh, our research because we could see how to generalize this to more general settings. Uh, and uh, yes, that's the uh, purpose of my talk here. And uh, this problem also appears. So this integral of the square of a polynomial from an, a family of orthogonal polynomials with respect to some weight function is something which occurs a lot in uh, physics problems when they look at, uh, let's say, the momentum problems in classical quantum mechanics. Also uh, for our community, uh, this, those are the Somers papers. They also have this kind of, of integrals. And so the main uh, aim of my talk is to give you some results which you might be able to use uh, to improve your results or even uh, get better results by uh, yes, showing you how to compute those integrals. Well, uh, the polynomials we are look at here in uh, my talk in the paper are the gigabar polynomials. So you can introduce them using this uh, generated function relation. They are called classical orthogonal polynomials with respect to the weight function one minus x squared to the power lambda minus a half on the interval minus one, one. And uh, the orthogonality relation you have there, the h n lambda is of course well known here. Uh, we are more interested what happens if you replace the weight function by a different weight function. I also have to give you the standard normalization because without that, uh, my asymptotic results would not be uh, understandable because you would not know with respect to which standard normalization we 
consider that. And uh, that's the classic, the usual one. So the function value at one should be the two lambda po hammer n divided by n factorial. Remember this expression, it will turn up as a, as a normalization factor later on as well. We can give an asymptotic expansion of that very easily simply by rewriting it as a ratio of gamma functions. And then uh, we know how to deal with ratios of gamma functions. So actually we can write down the complete asymptotic expansion using what we know about the ratio of gamma functions. Here it's only the main part. Okay, uh, so as I said, this formula is well known, so we can write it down and uh, we can give the asymptotic expansion. Here, the main term, the leading term is given. The interesting question is, of course, what if the weight function is of the wrong form? So this uh, has not the right powers, it is of a different kind because uh, you don't have always a choice in the weight function. You would like to have a certain weight function to use also the Nuggets relation, but the application enforces or sort of forces you to take a different weight function. And uh, there are ways around that. So you can, for example, uh, use some connecting formula. You rewrite your expressions in terms of the right uh, what about polynomials with your respect to your weight function. However, this will introduce a, a new layer of complexity in your computation. So, I mean, if you do that, then you see, okay, instead of a simple sum, you have a double sum, or you have a multiple sum, you have to interchange those sums and resum stuff. And again, it's uh, very tricky then to say something about the symptotic relations. So it's easier to get uh, exact formulas, but they don't help you very much if you can tell something about the symptotic relations, uh, because uh, in most cases we're interested, or well, I'm aware of, you want to have uh, asymptotic relations. Okay, so what to do then? Uh, the setting of the paper and what I want to talk about here is uh, the most general setting are the Jacobi weights. So we have one minus X to the power alpha, one plus X to the power beta. Uh, and we have the Gegenbauer polynomials as our target functions. Uh, the first observation is that since uh, we take the square, it doesn't matter that the, the sign uh, comes outside because of the symmetry, symmetry relation. So the order of alpha and beta do not matter. And this is, uh, is, is nice because we can fix an arbitrary order for our parameters and we don't have to worry about um, cases which uh, involve the, the, the other order. So we assuming here that uh, alpha has to be like greater than minus one, it can be at most beta. So beta is the larger value, alpha is the smaller value, uh, can be at most uh, beta. So this is our first thing we should remember here that uh, there's no restriction if I tell you later, okay, we assume uh, minus one is less than alpha is less than beta or at most beta. Okay, uh, as I said, explicit formulas can be easily obtained. Uh, we express them in terms of uh, generalized hypergeometric functions. So you know the definition here, uh, the, the FPQ functions here in terms of ratio of Pochhammer symbols. So I have written them up again, people who haven't seen it before. Uh, I have a course about asymptotic methods and sometimes we discuss uh, does this mean no, a rising or a falling factorial. I am talking about rising factorials, but I write the N down as a, sub, as a, uh, a subscript. So some people do it the other way. I mean here Pochhammer symbols, the N is written as a subscript and this uh, these are rising factorials, you can write them as a ratio of gamma functions if needed. Okay, uh, what else is important here? Important is here that we not only use the hypergeometric function in the, on the real line, which is the usual way how to deal with them. We also need them in the complex plane. And uh, for that, we use uh, the cut from one to infinity along the real axis. So that's a, a crucial part for the uh, asymptotic analysis method. Okay, so uh, once we have that, we can give here the 
explicit formula. So it's a very nice 5F4 function. You have the square of the, uh, of the function value at one of the Gegenbauer polynomials you're dealing with, some other terms, normalization factors, and uh, this uh, behavior here where we have this strange uh, radius here, which we later can see can be combined when you write out the series into one Hochhammer symbol, which is uh, useful in later computations. How do you compute that? Well, uh, first, when we did that, I used some, some generating function relations for the square of the, of the Gegenbauer polynomials. Um, so you could do that all. And then I found a paper by Sanchez Lewis who uh, actually considered the square of Gegenbauer polynomials, how to express them, how to deal with them. Also the other cases which are not considered in our, in the, in our paper, namely what happens if lambda goes to zero and such things. So we, we only consider positive lambda. So, uh, and uh, based on this paper, because we have now a nice expression in terms of powers of one minus x squared, we can then use this integral will integration integral here to rewrite the coefficients. And if I sum up everything, rewrite everything as programmer symbols, I end up with my uh, five of four. Um, the five of four is a polynomial as you can see. So we have minus N here. There's only one minus sign here. So this is an alternating uh, sum if you write it up and uh, you evaluate this polynomial at one. So you might think, okay, uh, we know a lot about this polynomial, so you can find it somewhere. It wasn't the case. <laughs> so we had to come up with a different method to find out the asymptotic relations. It's a uh, one balanced, which means that uh, if you sum up the parameters, uh, the, the up parameters and the down parameters, the difference is precisely one which is uh, for transformation helpful, but I couldn't find any useful transformation, which would help me to rewrite this in a more convenient way. So uh, we have here an exact formula in terms of a five for hypergeometric function. And uh, this uh, is not yet useful for uh, asymptotic analysis. Okay, so uh, we can do some specializations as you see then, uh, I mean, if the, two parameters alpha and beta are the same, then uh, we can immediately see that the 5.4 reduces to a 4.3. And uh, when we choose the mu, so I'm writing here, when both parameters are the same parameter, we write, we write this in a way that uh, we would recognize this from uh, Gegenbauer weights. So we have then uh, a, a constant minus a half if this constant mu is exactly lambda, we are back to the well-known case uh, where we have uh, the Gegenbauer polynomials integrated against the correct, the right uh, weight function. And uh, the reduction gives you a 3-2 hypergeometric function, which can be computed using the pfaff sarschitz theorem. And after some uh, rewriting, we end up with the expression I have given you before. So, uh, we have this three-step process. Uh, we have alpha, beta different, uh, and then we can consider alpha, beta is the same, but then we consider them as uh, some mu minus a half to, more, uh, to be more in the spirit of uh, Gegenbauer weights. And uh, if the mu becomes lambda, then we are back to the well-known uh, case of the Gegenbauer polynomials multiplied against the correct, the right weight function. Okay, uh, well, let's look at the explicit formula for the Gegenbauer weight, not for the right lambda, so for some different uh, mu here. Uh, then we have this formula resulting from uh, what I've given you before. Uh, however, this is not the only way to derive such a formula. We could also have used uh, those connecting coefficients. So we could have expressed our uh, Gegenbauer polynomials. I have here Cn lambdas, square of it in terms of the Gegenbauer polynomials with um, mu as a coefficient, so as, as an index. And um, then we would have an, a sum of such, uh, a combination of such uh, Gegenbauer polynomials. And if you use them, you end up with uh, a second uh, 
formula, which has now the advantage that the terms are positive. So um, we have an alternating series of sum here because of the minus here, but those terms here are all positive. The, the issue of, lambda, of mu being zero is not an issue here because uh, either this mu cancels with uh, this Pochhammer symbol, or if this is not present, it has to cancel with uh, what's up there. So um, we can say, okay, we can consider this in, in terms of a limit relation, uh, mu goes to zero, et cetera, how you want to look at that. So uh, we can extend this to the case mu is zero as well. Uh, just that you don't wonder why I divide by zero here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've tried to rewrite, uh, resum this as a, a hypergeometric function. It's a way more complicated hypergeometric function. So uh, if you want to use an explicit formula, I guess you would want to use the first one, and not this one. But if you need positive terms in your expansion, then you might go for the second one. Then you would have positive terms in your ex expansion in your formula. Uh, you see also the notation I'm using here for a particular case of uh, uh, the gegenbar weight here. So we, instead of I n and this uh, configuration of parameters, we use a J n of lambda mu. So whenever you see something like this here, we are in the gegenbar weight setting. If you see something like this here, we are in the more general uh, Jacobi weight setting. Okay, this is the special case for gegenbar weights. Uh, a remark, uh, you see already here in uh, the second formula, this expression here, if this becomes a negative um, integer, then of course at some point this will produce zeros, which means that this is not a sum going up to n over two. If n is sufficiently large, it will end after k terms. So k plus one if you count the zero term as well. So you can use this expression here already to derive an asymptotic relation for uh, the, the game bar weight if uh, lambda minus mu is a negative integer. So this is the case uh, I'm looking here at. So we have mu minus lambda is some uh, k natural number. So it's a positive integer. Zero doesn't make sense because we already know how to deal with that. So uh, then we have this expression here, which is a finite sum does not depend uh, the, the number of terms does not depend on n, so which means we can use this uh, for constructing an uh, asymptotic relation simply by replacing all the uh, crucial parts here, the ratio of gamma function by the asymptotic relation. Here we have uh, again a ratio of gamma function. Here we have something which we can um, uh, construct into it. And so we get uh, uh, an asymptotic relation. Those are all of the same. If I consider the terms, term by term, they're all of the same order. So, uh, which means I can produce here the first term, the remainder term, and um, more terms if I want, but the computations are more and more complicated because we have here this square here, etc. So, uh, if you need terms, you will probably give this to Mathematica and this will compute you the first few terms uh, for this. Uh, relation if you need that. You can also get the remainder term as well. So uh, this is a special case, uh, which will be mentioned later as a non-generic uh, case. So we won't consider this case anymore. Uh, if we turn it around, so lambda minus mu, uh, then you see a, a, an integer, a positive integer. It's also possible to show that you get uh, a polynomial, but uh, we couldn't see how to find this polynomial from our asymptotic approach. So we had to make a detour first uh, finding a, a appropriate uh, ODE, solving that, seeing that this is a polynomial you get, and then we could identify the coefficients by using the asymptotic approach. So uh, that's a detour for, but uh, this is the other case. So if mu minus lambda is an integer, positive or negative or zero, then we know how to deal with the game bar case. In a direct way, if it's not a case, then we are in uh, closer to the uh, generic setting, but we have to be careful also there, there are special settings between uh, the parameters which give uh, a finer case by case uh, uh, 
uh, distinguishing. Okay, so let's come to the uh, connecting formulas, uh, which are also interesting. So how can I express the basic generic setting alpha beta in terms of other uh, uh, formulas here? So those are the, the game bar. The game bar setting here is the, the Jacobi setting. You can see if you put in here an integer written as, as a 2m plus an eater, it is 0, 1, and m is an integer. Then you can write this as a sum with m terms, but in terms of the uh, of the quantities with respect to the gang bar weight, for which you can uh, write down the expansions more easily than for the general case. But you can reduce now, you know now how to deal with if beta minus alpha is an integer. So this is a connected formula. We have also a more complicated connected formula where we have alpha and beta here and we change lambda to a row, but uh, what you end up with is a sum with n terms. So you can write down an explicit expression with respect to a different uh, constant here, uh, but this is not very useful in um, is not very useful in asymptotic considerations because you have to deal with uh, a sum of n terms and n is the asymptotic variable. So it's uh, it's not very useful in this context, but you have connecting formulas. And then we use for this connecting formulas the paper by uh, that I have given here you uh, as a reference by those two Spanish people. Okay, so um, how can we deal with this? So we have an explicit uh, formula, but they are not nice with regard to uh, asymptotic analysis. I mean, uh, Nico Temi and so on looked at those things, but I don't think that he did it in particular with this special case. There's also Luke in his book, he deals with this kind of sums, but he uses a different method. So it's very, difficult to get uh, more than the first few terms from his method. Uh, so we decided to do it in a different way. Uh, first, um, starting on the same starting point, namely we want to have a, a generating function for, for our, our two norms. Um, the question was, what is the right uh, normalization factor here? It turns out it's this one. This is one over the, the value of the gang bar polynomial at one. So if you do that, then you get a rather simple looking uh, hypergeometric function relation for 4, 3, F3. This is uh, a half balanced one. So uh, we can't use any transformation which work with one balanced ones. So, uh, but uh, it's, it's useful for us because we have a negative sign here. Uh, and also we have here the possibility either if you expand about zero, then we will get back what we have here. Or if we expand about one, then we will have uh, a new series expansion, which gives us information about the asymptotics of the coefficients in this generating function. And uh, the main uh, tool here is asymptotic analysis, uh, which I will explain later a little bit. So uh, this is our generating function. We have here, uh, as you can see nicely, that uh, the symmetry in alpha and beta. Uh, this here looks strange, but actually, if you write out the series here, you should combine them into one term. You have a Pochhammer symbol of uh, 2k if k is the dummy index here. So uh, this needs to be split up into two Pochhammer symbols if you want to write this as a hypergeometric function. Uh, this gives this strange uh, form here. Okay, so. Uh, the proof is, as I said, uh, if you do the right normalization factor, it boils down to a double series here. You can interchange summation and end up with the sum here, which you can either compute using Mathematica, or you can see it if you um, change the index here and then uh, split this program symbol apart, you end up with some power of one minus Z uh, and uh, you have the Z, uh, to the power L because of the index shift here. And uh, what's going on here and the factor here is coming from splitting up uh, a Pochhammer symbol of the double of double L here. So that's uh, what's going on here. So it's uh, not a difficult thing. If you specialize again using uh, the R phase equal beta and recall it's 
mu minus a half for us always, then you get an even simpler uh, generating function relation uh, with uh, here with mu plus one in the lower part and mu plus a half in the upper one. Uh, it's an interesting fact here probably to mention that if you change the signs of a half here, one, two plus, the other stays minus, you get the same expression here. Reason is because if you split apart, this is here the case for this case here, you can split this factor apart and then you have one times this here, which gives you this here and the other one is um, um, skew symmetric functions give zero. So this is a, a kind of symmetry here, I'm not, don't know how to exploit that, but it might be possible to exploit this symmetry as well. Um, okay, so we're interested in asymptotic results. So how can we work them out? Here are them. So I present them first, then I'm talking about how to prove them. Uh, you see here the interesting fact that the transition point between those three uh, different expansions is lambda minus one. It's not lambda minus a half, as you would perhaps expect, because lambda minus a half is the weight for the uh, game bar polynomials, but it's not lambda minus a half, it's lambda minus one. Uh, so this is the case when the following thing happens. So uh, the, the term hidden here in the big O term here plays a role if I I'll let alpha go to alpha zero. And so it has, has to be taken into account, which produces this log factor here and some, some, some other stuff here. Which, um, so this is one way to see that. Also, if I do it from this point of view here, then uh, this is hidden in the big O notation, this comes out. Uh, so then, then you have to take into, into, into account the term hidden in the big O notation, take the limit, and you end up this year. But uh, actually we proved it not this way. We simply uh, considered what happens if lambda, if uh, this alpha is lambda minus, a, minus one and then looked what was going on with our formulas. So this is the uh, asymptotic expansion. It, the splitting point here for our three different branches is lambda minus one and not lambda minus a half. Uh, and notice we have this order here, which is uh, an arbitrary assumption. Okay, uh, if we look at the game bar weights, so uh, then I should note here, this is, the, this is the leading term. The leading term, uh, we don't have to worry about certain um, uh, generic or non-generic cases, so we can do that independently of that. If I want to get more terms, I have to split up my considerations in different cases and uh, that then uh, introduces, uh, well, it's easy for the non-generic, it's easy for the generic case, it becomes more and more difficult the more restrictions you have on your, on your uh, configuration. So how does alpha, beta, and lambda are interrelated with each other. Okay, so we here give you only the main term, but we know all the terms and I will present the formulas there later on. Um, if we specialize for the Gingbauer weight, we also, of course, here is the main term. We have three branches. Uh, again, uh, since we have rewritten everything in terms of mu, the mu zero is mu minus a half, but recall, that's lambda minus one. So we have the same splitting point. Uh, and uh, again, uh, if we can take the limits, either coming from this case here, uh, we have to take into account what's hidden in the big O term, which produces a log term. And um, here the D gamma function, uh, which is the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function and uh, a remainder term, which has a log n in uh, next to the power here as well. Okay, so those, those are the main terms of uh, uh, asymptotics. For the complete asymptotics, I will refer to the next section. Uh, this is the next section, the proof idea. Uh, what, is, what are the methods we use? We use singularity analysis. So we have a generating function and this paper explains how to uh, then extract information about the uh, asymptotic nature of the coefficients in the generating function 
coming from the behavior of the generating function uh, at a particular point at one in our case. So uh, we have set up our, uh, our stage for that. We have the generating function. It has all the properties uh, needed for application of this uh, framework. And you can find this paper. I have given you a link as well. Uh, that's the link to the journal. Uh, I think people have also that on their websites, etc. as you can find the paper there. Um, the result here, this is just the first introductory result in the paper as well. If you have a certain uh, subset of your uh, complex plane, which is the, uh, the disk of radius one plus epsilon, it's uh, so this is assumed that uh, our um, function we're interested in has uh, a radius of convergence one. So we deal here with uh, something which is slightly larger, one plus epsilon, but we um, cut away a sector, uh, a sector which has this vertex one and is open up to the left, to the right. So it, this part is removed from, from, the, um, from the disk. Uh, you can draw that yourself. So it's, near. it's an exercise for people from, um, from our functional uh, analysis course to do that. Uh, anyway, uh, if you know that uh, you have a function f of z, which has a singularity only at one, you have this section for some epsilon larger, epsilon, uh, epsilon larger than zero and some phi larger than pi over two. And uh, you know that this function has this property that in the neighborhood of one, it behaves like uh, one line of set in absolute relative to some power alpha. Then the, the uh, coefficients in your uh, generating function have this order. So this is a, a first uh, glimpse how they will behave. But of course you want to do to know more. You also want to know terms in the asymptotic expansion. And uh, the paper also gives you uh, a way how to extract them from uh, the generating function. And this is the easiest case somehow. So you have your uh, function, your generating function. You can express this in terms of the first k terms. So k plus one terms, we start here from uh, index zero, you have a remainder which behaves like this way. The exponents are ordered in rising uh, order here. So, but not uh, strictly less than beta. Then you can translate this immediately into uh, an asymptotic expansion uh, for the coefficients, simply by keeping the coefficients alpha, alpha uh, ak here and replace this here by a uh, uh, binomial here of the form n minus alpha k minus one over n. So you have to be careful how you write here the, the sign here. It's not the same sign as in the, in the paper. Um, so we have to change then the result. So this can be dangerous if you don't pay attention. <laughs> okay, so uh, this uh, this polynomials can be of course expanded. Um, it's it's a matter of taste if you write polynomials here, uh, the binomials here, not binomials here, or you combine them to those two into a Pochhammer symbol, and you can write those in Pochhammer symbols. So uh, that depends on taste or what you want to do. Uh, we of course know how to expand them, in, and uh, this is the leading term behavior. So uh, this simple form of my of my, uh, my uh, function f here, the generating function with such powers immediately translates here. We have of course more complicated ones uh, as you can see uh, in a moment. So, uh, but this is a nice way to extract the asymptotic expansion of your coefficients from the generating function. And um, okay, so we start in the Jacobi weight case with our F43 function here. There's a way to rewrite this as a, a path integral, as a million bonds integral, as, as those are called here. Uh, so you translate here 
everything that's above here becomes gamma functions here of, of your integ integration variable plus lambda here. We have a second one. So we have here a square here. We have alpha and beta here. And this here comes from uh, the formula for the Lillian Barnes transformation. And then you have also the, uh, the this parameter translates directly. And this and this here is translated here by combining them into one gamma function, which introduces this factor 16 here instead of four here. So this is the explanation why you get something uh, different here. The minus sign goes away here. And uh, this is the appropriate uh, way to write our generating function because now we can either move the, the, the path of integration to the uh, right, then we will turn up with this here or to the left, which will give us the form we, are, we want to have to uh, for our uh, generating function so that we can see what happen what's happening at uh, the point one. Uh, okay, so for the path, we have to assume that all the poles, which are here in the blue part, are to the left of the path of integration and the pole poles coming from this here are to the right, which is usually when you write this this way, you move along the imaginary axis. You have to dent the uh, the curve or the path of integration when you when you cross over the um, real axis because you would otherwise run through the first pole of this here. And the dent is to the left, so that uh, we have here uh, the right form of the path. It can be shown then uh, when we move the the contour to the left over the poles, one after after the other. Uh, we get, uh, of course, the, the residuals if we do that, plus an integral of this form, but for a different path. And uh, you can estimate this integral. It gives you the right form. So uh, we have something we can use for our asymptotic analysis. So the, the task is move your contour to the left, uh, collect all the residuals, and uh, then work with the sum of all the residuals. Uh, this is done, okay, in the next slide here. So I'm skipping over some uh, details, which I will explain in more detail when I do the, the, um, the gig bar weights because they are simpler to deal with. Uh, what we get is uh, then uh, a sum with four different parts. Uh, one part has this power here and the other, if you exclude that you have a, a power series in one minus z here. Then the another part is with this power here. And then you have the logarithmic uh, uh, modification. And then you have a power series. Uh, when you do this coming from, from this side here, you only know this is an asymptotic formula. So uh, why should this be the right form? And uh, you can then verify that by simply uh, finding out that this function here, if you continue this analytically to the slit plane, slit it from one to infinity, it will satisfy uh, one, two, three, four order ODE uh, with, uh, with uh, regular uh, singularities at zero, one infinity. And uh, you can then find out that one, you have then uh, the, the proper powers here for, for your modification in the Frobenius method. These are the proper powers here. You have a log term because of the double uh, occurrence, uh, which you already saw there, the gamma function S plus lambda, and you have a power series, which you don't really need to know because this power series does not play a role in the asymptotics. So uh, we only have to find out those coefficients here. And um, this can be done. Um, and I haven't written up the formulas here because they are too cumbersome. They would go over several slides here and it doesn't add anything uh, for us. Uh, then once we have that here, we can simply translate them into an asymptotic. So this is, uh, as we have seen before, a power and these coefficients here. So we can immediately translate this to the, uh, to the binomials. However, we have here double, uh, a double pole here, and, um, and and I haven't told you that we are looking at a generic case here. So the generic case means we have a double pole at uh, minus lambda and all the integer um, uh, remove 
removed are one integer to the left from that. So this in introduces a lattice of, 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 of powers here. And um, we have here uh, simple powers here at minus and alpha plus one in parentheses and minus beta plus one in parentheses and all the things with, which goes on to the left. So uh, double pole and simple powers, this is the generic case. And you can come up with reasons why this uh, cannot always be the case because there's an opportunity here that something that a pole from here can cancel either a pole from here or here or here or something can going on here. So those are the non-generic cases which are special cases and we consider separately uh, to not clutter our uh, approach here. So in the generic case here, we have this nice structure here and we can translate this into binomials here and uh, then for the double pole here, we have to look up what uh, the paper by Fragile is, uh, what to do with such situations. And the right translation is a factor of this four here. Uh, and this gives you the asymptotic expansion. You have see here this as a um, infinite series here, but of course this has to be understood in the sense that you pick uh, the, the right uh, leading term, the right next term, the right next next term, etc. So this works in the framework. So you can write this. Uh, in uh, symbolically as infinite series, but uh, uh, then you have to pick out the, the leading term, next term, etc., by looking at this the particular choice of alpha um, and beta and uh, lambda. Um, that was done when we uh, computed the main term. Um, then we had to assume certain relations between alpha and lambda, and then uh, at one point uh, I had take this here and the other point I had to take this here um, and then uh, you can do well and the, the transition point means then to plug into this formula here the particular case that alpha is uh, lambda minus one and uh, this gives you then uh, a problem here triple pole here which we will uh, and you have to of course to compute the uh, residuals for this particular case. I have done this with Mathematica and as long as you have a generic case, there's no problem with that. If you're in the non-generic case, you have to work uh, to get the right expressions and their expressions are of course more complicated, but you can write them up. You can defer general formulas for them as well. Okay, uh, so for the gang bar weights here, we see everything becomes easier. We still have in the generic case, a double pole here and uh, a simple pole here. So we can do as we, what we did before, we shift the, the contour to the left and collect all the uh, residuals. So this is what's happening here. So we have the poles at minus lambda, lambda minus L. And uh, when I combine all those residuals, then I get uh, an expression like this here, some hypergeometric 3F2 function. Uh, the log here is the, uh, as the logarithmic singularity here and some power series with more complicated terms. We don't need for our asymptotic uh, analysis, but we can write up those terms. And uh, this comes from the lambda part and from the mu part, you get a, a simpler expression in terms again of a 3F2 uh, here. Of course, this is not yet written in the form of a series uh, of one minus set. So you still have to to invest work here, but it's not difficult to rewrite that in this way to get the power series in one minus set either multiplied by this logarithmic here for this part here, you have to reformulate this here and here you have a power series of uh, one minus set multiplied with the right powers. Okay, uh, so this also gives you now uh, an expansion here in one minus z with a logarithmic singularity with this here and the power series, which you can also justify by looking at the, the uh, now we have one, two, three, we have a, a ODE of, uh, of order three here, and you can uh, find that you have to take this modification, this modification and a power series for your uh, Frobenius ansatz uh, to get the uh, generating function relation and we can translate this again immediately into uh, the uh, asymptotic form for the coefficients in the generating function. 
by introducing those binomials and because we have a double pole by this expression for the double pole term. You notice this term here, this pops up because in our general, in our generating function, this was actually on the other side, which was the normalization factor we looked uh, at to sum up those terms here. So um, this is now written on the right hand side. Okay, uh, so I told you we had this special case when mu was lambda minus a half. So if I put, plug this into my formula here, we have here triple power. Uh, and then, uh, well, this will not cancel. Here we might have uh, cancellation. If we have integers here, uh, then you will see that this can happen something, but we will assume here um, for, the, for the derivation of the main, of the leading term, this doesn't matter. For more terms, you have to make a case uh, by case study, uh, uh, either for a triple or for a double one when one of the poles goes away. And I use Mathematica to compute that. Uh, after long, longer computation, you get an expression of this form here. And this is the remainder integral. So you can see it. And uh, one can show this is uh, of one minus z squared log one minus z uh, squared again. Uh, you need that if you want to look into the paper by uh, Flachelet to uh, actually find out what is the remainder term uh, so that you have everything right. Um, then um, this here is still not given in the right form here. We need an expansion in terms of one minus z. So you have to rewrite that again. And if you do that, you end up with this here. Uh, and this is the generating function, you can translate this into the um, into the right asymptotic form again, which I have shown you the first term of at the, uh, the main theorem. Uh, I'm not doing here the translation. Uh, you have here a square of a logarithm, so you have to look even deeper into the paper about uh, singularity analysis to find out what you have to do in your translation. Uh, so uh, that's the case here. Okay, so, uh, well, I'm almost at the end of my talk here. So uh, then what more? Uh, one thing which happens often is that you don't really use all the interval you have from minus one to plus one in our case. So you uh, stay away from one. This week we can could call them incomplete integrals. So they, they need to be studied. Um, well, you can use the results we have now, and then you split the way uh, for small epsilon what's going on. Um, but of course you introduce a new level of complexity by a new parameter, a new function actually, which can depend on n, so this epsilon. Um, so um, then it depends on how this epsilon of n relates to the, to the parameter, et cetera, to find out if terms are canceled, if you introduce new terms, if you introduce a different scale in your asymptotics. So um, that's something uh, I have on my to-do list to look a little bit into. Uh, the other one is to replace uh, the Gegenbauer polynomials by Jacobi polynomials. I have done that. And I ended up with an exact formula, which is a, a generalization of, uh, of uh, hypergeometric functions, but for two variables. So I uh, don't know enough yet to deal with them. Uh, so they, they are more tricky to deal with. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the case with your Jacobi polynomials would be more interesting because they turn up more often or even more often than with Gegenbauer polynomials. Uh, and uh, of course, other weight functions because you don't always have those nice Jacobi weight functions. You have probably functions coming from a, a probability density function, which might also make it interesting to not look up the full, in, the full interval because you could have singular uh, weight functions so that you stay away from the singularity, etc. cetera. So uh, this uh, is also something on the to-do list which can be done. Uh, for future research. And uh, well, uh, one of my uh, uh, motivations to come to that was that I uh, am still trying to find out something about the sum of distances of Fibonacci lattice points on the sphere. And uh, you have to deal there with uh, integrals of, of 
associated uh, to COVID polynomials, particular also about uh, absolute values, etc. cetera. So, uh, and uh, as long as we cannot deal with them, uh, I'm kind of stuck in this problem to show that uh, they have this nice property one would expect from uh, almost optimal integration points for integration on the sphere uh, up to some log factor, uh, power of log factor. That was uh, the end more. And uh, that's probably the point here where I should uh, stop with my talk. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much for a nice talk. Uh, please, these questions. Johan, uh, thank you for for your uh, talk. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning that uh, there was some motivation uh, from physics papers. Could you maybe say a couple of words? Is it uh, does it have to do with uh, uh, measures on SON, or is there something else? Well, they have uh, the problem of momentum computations for different problems. And uh, so the momentum of, of, I don't know, I have seen recently a paper about uh, the hydrogen atom um, and they wanted to, to compute momentums for that and they end up with such integrals. So uh, that that's, uh, I think most of the cases is you have to compute some integral, you, you compute some expectation values, some um, variance, et cetera. The, the weight function is given from, from your distribution that you have now an expansion in terms of spherical harmonics, et cetera, or whatever you can come up with. And then uh, those collide. And uh, the standard way is, of course, to get around that to rewrite your expansion using those connecting formulas. But uh, if you can do it more directly, it's more interesting. And there are a lot of papers about how to do it more directly. So how you can deal with those integrals in a direct way instead of uh, rewriting them uh, as expression as expansions of more suitable polynomials. So those are coming from. Uh, I mean, we have mentioned a couple of papers in the in the in the uh, bibliography of our of our paper. But uh, if you Google for that, you find a lot of physics papers with, that deal with that problem. So it's probably the main uh, driving point coming from there. But also, I would think that uh, people from statistics or probability theory will also have to deal a lot with this kind of, of integrals. And of course, our community, so with the ensembles, <laughs> so they also have this problem. Yeah, so, so you mentioned at the end, so, so I, I mean, obviously, if, if this is something you're, you're working on, you may not uh, want to share too directly, but OK, so what's the statement for Fibonacci points? So you're hoping they are good for uh, uh, pairwise distances. The, well, I mean, uh, the conjecture is that the, the L2 discrepancy is almost optimal. So that, that up to a power of a logarithm, uh, I'm not sure if we can get, can get rid of this logarithm. I mean, this would be really nice. So that would be really mean that you have a, a constructible point configuration on the on the unit sphere, for which you can actually guarantee the discrepancy. Um, I mean, if you take the the points which uh, are such that they uh, maximize the sum of distances, then you know they have the optimal L two discrepancy. They have the optimal L two discrepancy, but you can't right. can't see. get mm -hmm. them. You can't get them because compute, computing them is a, a non-feasible uh, problem because of the of the optimization process. On the other hand, you have a lot of uh, point sets that you can. Uh, I mean, you take a, a map from the from the unit square to the unit sphere, by which uh, preserves area, etc. The Lambert transformation, for example. So the whole world of of point configurations in the unit square is open sure. to you. So you can move them up mm -hmm. to the sphere, but you can't prove anything about them. I mean, anything. I mean, anything which is more useful than what you can say about random points on the sphere. And that's, uh, as far as I know, still the best, uh, the best. Uh, result and that was what, I, what um, Christoph Eisleitner, and myself and, 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 and uh, Joseph Dick got that uh, it's it, that the points which can be constructed coming from a lattice um, are at least as uh, as good as random points. <laughs> so that they yeah. have one over square root of n uh, growth for the L2 discrepancy, which 
which is a well, it's an embarrassing result actually because you want to be much better than that. So uh, one breakthrough would be really uh, to get this epsilon, epsilon more that you can get away from the one over square root of n for the for the behavior. And then you can probably try to settle uh, the problem. Um, can you get configurations which are almost optimal for the L2 discrepancy? And which is a true discrepancy is measured mm -hmm. by means of the sum of distances. So that's, sure. yeah. mm -hmm. that's the nice thing there. And they will also give you uh, good point sets for integration because uh, if you want to integrate on the on the Sobolev space uh, with index three halves, then you can write your uh, Sobolev norm in a way that you end up with. Uh, with, with the sum of distances again, as the reproducing kernel. So the, the distance is the reproducing kernel. And uh, this immediately gives you the connection why this sum of distance is such a central thing for not, for, not only for energy considerations, but also for um, numerical integration, but also for uh, the discrepancy consideration, in particular for constructed point sets on the, on the sphere. Thanks. That's a, that's a great answer. So, so I, I actually have a follow-up question to this rather than yes, to talk. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in your paper with uh, uh, Joseph and Chris, uh, I think, so, so what you prove works for every nice point set on the square if you project it right the proof is not just for the Fibonacci set right if no no start, this, this works more more general right if you, if you start with any well distributed set in some sense um, so uh do numerical experiments somehow show that the Fibonacci lattice seems to be one of the best uh, do you uh, what what happens if you take the vendor corporate set for example and and project uh, is it worse does it seem that it's worse or well, they are there quite well. I mean, we had a, a, a student coming from school doing here some numerics, so he did all mm -hmm. this, the usual, uh, all the usual suspects, spiral points, um, mm -hmm. solar points, etc. So they're all quite well. So I mean that, okay. uh, yeah, it's an embarrassing thing that you can't prove that uh, that they actually do well. So that's, I mean, the the okay in in the paper with with, with Christoph and then Josie. Uh, we have the problem or the technical problem there is that at one point we use estimates for um, convex sets and uh, so for convex uh, for the discrepancy of convex sets and uh, this um, this this destroys everything so this yeah, this yeah, is the, yeah. the reason which 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 destroys everything so um, if you can do can get around that of course you uh, should get better results mm -hmm. okay Some other questions? Um, I have a small question. Actually, I wanted to ask because these are two questions that you have on your last slide about uh, uh, about Jacobi polynomials and about uh, the uh, incomplete integrals. But maybe is it possible to to get the similar results more easily? For example, for the half of this integral, for like minus one to zero, or to from zero to one, or for some other um particular cases yes but i would think that usually you want to go to the end point of the of the integral <laughs> so i mean uh, of course uh, you can you should be able to get that is uh, i mean there are not the symmetry relations anymore you have to come yeah. up with a different Some way practice. to compute that uh, but um uh, yes uh I mean, the reason why one minus epsilon uh, is interesting for me is that uh, there are some, some, for example, point sets you plug in and you don't use the full, uh, the full interval because the points are apart from each other. So you don't have uh, one as, as an input in your integral. So you have the, the, uh, the smallest possible distance. So which, which corresponds then to a certain value in your, in your integral. So you only want to go to this value and use then the geometric uh, properties of the of the separation of points to enter into your integral as a as a contribution to the upper bound, and uh, this would give you this incomplete uh, integral. Uh, also, if you 
stay away from from your singularity you can of course be more general in your weight functions where you can introduce a, a singular weight function a risk kernel or whatever if this is helpful in your computation instead of 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 going to some expansion of your distance and trying to work out the degrees in this sense. So, uh, yeah, if there's an application when you only want to go to zero, yes, why uh, it just, Yeah, I was like uh, some 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 weeks ago just makes making some um, made some uh, computations. I was like integrals from zero to one, and it was like okay, so. yeah, it could be. I, I'm not aware of, of of applications for that, but. Uh, um, if you can do that, but you have to do different formulas than what we had here. So, I mean, but this should, this should be possible to do it. Thank you. Some other questions? Tanya, there is a comment in the chat about this. Oh, yeah, I see uh, now. Yeah. I don't know where I put my. So Damir says Damir says he actually considered the integral zero to one in his paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we that minus one, one minus one one. Yes, I mean I also looked into into Carlos and, and Damir's paper, and they have these inequalities there for the integral from minus one to one, to one, I think. And of course, if that's what we have done, you can write down the explicit expression as well as the asymptotic relations for that. I'm not sure if this helps in the in the determination of the asymptotics that they have. So, but such things can now be dealt with with what we have. Maybe maybe when you publish it, it would be nice. If uh, you make these integrals uh, go into the big tables, like you know, like like this book and so on, they should have the integrals that you computed inside. Uh, what do you mean, uh, the computations? I mean, uh, the paper is on archive. It's also submitted. It should. It's, it's... Yeah, I know. I know. I, I just I just say that. Uh, I mean, once it's uh, published and so on. Uh, yeah. that, uh, people usually when they they want to know if an integral is known uh they will go to tables you know so maybe it would be ah, nice. okay i don't know tables per yeah i have to look this up uh, like uh, this sitting good book or there are other uh, famous ones and usually i mean i myself usually go and if i don't find an integral there i assume it's not known but it's certainly oh, more okay. than that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, like the, i have uh, uh Brodnikov at all on my table. So <laughs> then I look into them and if the integral is still, I know what then I can work with them. Yeah, you should ask you should ask the next editions to include your integrals. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't know. So <laughs> I mean they're all they other collections. So I, I, I saw from um Vadim Sudelin um paper about hypergeometric function, and there are a couple of thousand papers dealt with in one in one stroke. So because he writes down whole families of such integrals and transformations. So that's, uh, well, we have here a couple. Some other questions? Okay, maybe when this was the case, maybe we can stop recording and maybe somebody else will ask questions later.